Okay, Ashley O, I played about four hours of Doom Eternal a couple weeks ago, and now we can finally talk about it, and I'm excited because based on my demo of that game, I really liked it, and after talking to you, you said that you really liked Doom 2016, like a bunch of people, and you have good taste, so you wanted to know, uh, you had a few questions for me now that I've played about three and a half to four hours of Doom Eternal. Yes, my first question for you is, Glory kills. Which ones are your favorite? Which ones do you remember? Do you like them more or less than the previous? I'm glad you asked because the like one of the first things I did in this demo was I mean they they kind of like have very obvious tutorials. Like again, the game is throwback in a lot of ways. But I walked up to one of the base enemies. I I don't know if they changed their names in this game, but it was like a basic thrall, and I went, like did a downward hammer punch on top of his head. And his head went into his torso, and he made one of those faces like he was kind of like, like you know, when a cat you put something on a cat's nose and they kind of sink into their torso, and just in a less violent way. Yeah. He did that, and his face uh, made me laugh a lot. That was one thing about this demo. This game made me laugh a lot because of how just absolutely decidedly metal it is. Uh, that trailer that released last uh, week, where that opened with like a giant pentagram on the earth, where like. South America should be. That's the whole game. Like you're, you're. Cl they literally say you're clearing the demonic presence by percentages on Earth, and you're tracking these hell priests, uh, and you have to bring one of their heads to his brothers. To I don't know. I'm not even spoiling anything because so much happens. Um, Sounds like a very Doom type of story there. Yeah, and like speaking of, and I got to talk to Hugo Martin and Marty Stratton during like kind of in the middle of my demo, um, and they were saying that's a big aim for them is to kind of go all in on story, which is odd because Doom 2016 I felt was good because it was almost like an anti-narrative. Like it was like, we don't really need that. We just want to be fun. And we have a lot of stuff under the surface that's going to make you get into that flow state in this game. You don't necessarily need us to stop you for cutscenes. Um, but this game, they're, they're really going into that. They... They, there are cutscenes, um, and they but they did say like Hugo's like we made sure like none of them are going to be that much longer than sixty seconds, if that. Uh, we don't want people we don't want to pull people out of the game, which we've been, you know, like the the mechanics which we've been focusing on a ton. And we can get to that, but uh, you know, like I ran into other like incidental characters who weren't just like either this massive AI villain like at the end of the uh, 2016 game, or um, but like I ran into another person from this past battle on earth and they talk a lot about the history and like all those uh diary entries uh kind of logs are there i i really like those from 2016 and i i read like one or two during my demo but by the nature that because of the nature of the demo i was just trying to play as much of the game as possible um but it's there if you want to if you want to explore that and they said you know as long as it's not getting in the way of the players who want to ignore it then it's fine like you know, they're not trying to please everybody, but if the opportunity arises to please a ton of people, like, why not add some story for the people that really did, like, the flavor text from the first game and give, like, an actual, much more fleshed out narrative. So plot aside, tell me about the way the combat is different. I mean, I've seen in the trailer that it looks pretty similar and that you're encouraged to keep moving around, encouraged to switch weapons. But this one, I hear that there are a lot more new weapons and that they really set you up to experiment. Yeah, that was, that was I think, a lot of people's questions. And my question going in was, like, how do you really improve on Doom 2016? Like, I'm sure you could, like, there were flaws to that game. Not many, but I, I found, like, for instance, there was a bit too much platforming that was kind of punishing if you just, like, screwed up even a tiny bit. And there's platforming in this game, but it's not it's not completely punishing when you mess up and like all that aside they hugo was talking about it he's like he's like yes doom on the surface is junk food and everybody loves junk food and it's there for a reason it's called junk food for a reason but like everybody still a lot of people still like having junk food he's like we want to make junk food but like kind of sneak in the nutrition underneath so he's like we want to make healthy junk food which sounds like a paradox and it is but it's doom so it makes sense they you know like it, they, they said they didn't want to just do more of the same which again, would have been easy for this game because Doom 2016 was so solid and refined in its own right, but here they added these mechanics that aren't just more, they actually kind of revamp how you move through the world. Uh, for instance, Doom 2016 had, obviously the glory kills would give you health, so you'd want to do those every little bit, especially on harder difficulties, and it was really pushing you to move forward and assassinate these people so you could get that health you needed. Uh, and then there's also chainsaw kills, which would give you ammo. So when you would run low on ammo, which was fairly often in that game, it, like ammo is was scarce and it seemed even more scarce now. But they added something called a flame belch, which is a shoulder mounted flamethrower. And of course, like the name of everything else that I saw in the demo, it's just very 
uh, absurd and, and great. And when you light people on fire, it's, if you hurt them while they're ablaze, you will get armor. So they added that to that core loop. And it seems small, but it's just one other core pillar that you're kind of thinking about when you're in that flow state of moving forward. Maybe I need a glory kill. Maybe I need some ammo. Oh, there's chainsaw fuel. I'll go get that so I can get that ammo. Oh, my armor's low, but my health's fine. Why don't I just light these guys on fire and then throw a frag grenade into the middle of them or shoot a frag grenade from my other shoulder into the middle of them and I'll have a ton of armor. And it's extremely satisfying. And the game constantly did make me switch weapons, which was a huge focus of theirs because you and I were talking earlier the super shotgun was still, I mean, it's like the legacy weapon of the game outside of like the BFG, but they said they're like, we noticed like pretty much the vast majority of people were just kind of relying on it, or if not relying on it, like defaulting to it. And they said that's cool because they made a good weapon, but they made a bunch of other good weapons. And they wanted to make sure that people are rotating through them. So ammo was super scarce when I was playing during my demo. I was constantly switching from the rocket launcher to the heavy cannon to the uh, back to the original auto shotgun and it felt great to rotate through those and there was actually like certain weak points on certain demons like for uh kako demon for instance in this game if you have the grenade launcher mod equipped to the bottom of your uh your like auto shotgun if you shoot a grenade into his mouth he'll do this like kind of like little choke burp smoke coming out of his mouth but it automatically every time you do that sets him up for a glory kill so that would kind of encourage you oh i'm i have some rockets left but a like a rocket launcher isn't going to be the best weapon for this flying enemy uh, I'm going to switch to that, and then I'm, I need a glory kill, so I'm going to switch to my auto shotgun. It was very good at encouraging me to use my entire tool set, but it was also very fun to use my entire tool set. And I think that's difficult to do because a lot of old school games have weapon wheels, and, you know, like it, it's obviously Doom 2016 got away. It was one of the few games, was one of the games to get away from that two weapon loadout that Call of Duty kind of made ubiquitous, uh, like more than a decade ago. But it, it felt great to kind of just try out everything at my disposal. They also, I got an ice bomb which freezes enemies, and it's very useful. I got something, there's something they added called a blood punch. Ooh. Um, basically, I, th I forget how many, it's like, I think three or four, if you do three or four glory kills, you fill up this meter, and so your next melee attack, it doesn't have to be a glory kill, but your next melee attack, pretty much, you hit one enemy, and this AOE explosion just like, turns everybody else around you into blood, <laughs> and it kills them. Wait, so everybody around you explodes yep. in blood? I mean, like, the lower and lower level enemies, yes, but it just in general, even if there are higher level enemies around it, it'll just do a lot of AoE damage. So you'll notice, like, the screen will flash red and kind of flash, or, like, brighten, and then everybody around you will either die or just get very much hurt, but then that uh, that's another way, hey, like, I, I don't necessarily need health, but I have this blood punch, and I'm about to run out of ammo, and there's a caco demon right there that I think is almost at low, uh, like, no health, so I'll use that, and it felt... Like, it totally made sense what he was saying. It did feel like healthy junk food. It's like, I'm just having a blast. I'm laughing at all the absurd jokes in this game and how confident it is and, like, how self-aware it is, yet still willing to take itself seriously, if not, like, you know, not in a narcissistic way, but in a way that's like, it, it feels like it knows what it's doing, obviously. Um, the game just felt great. I walked away. It was, it was four hours of a much larger game, and that, the game is larger. Uh, it's sprawling. Like, when you see the map and you download the map data, kind of like going back to obviously Doom 2016, but back to like the Super Metroid days when you have to find the map data to download. You, I opened my map and I was like amazed at how sprawling it was. And there's a hub world where you go back to your um, your fortress to kind of, you get a training area, kind of like they had in like a Sekiro when you could challenge that immortal guy just to try out all your new, your tools and your abilities. Oh, and wow. yeah, and it's, it's, I asked them why they add, I was like, I feel like a hub world is kind of, um, Par for the course in like modern games now. Obviously, games of service, it makes sense to have one where there's like an MMO space or where you're collecting a lot of things to keep. Uh, like, obviously, there were collectibles in Doom 2016, but in the sense that they're just like cosmetics you're collecting, they're like, we get that, but the game is so sprawling, and we did kind of want to give you a sense of a place that could be familiar because the game is so large, and you're going to be, if you really want to invest in it, or whether you're like platinuming it or whatever you want to, what have you. We still wanted to give you a spot that would be familiar and where you could train or where you could, you know, like just come back to and maybe you want to do a few upgrades there, which you could do upgrades on the fly. But it was it was it was like a it seemed like a pretty well designed hub world. It didn't seem entirely necessary to me. But again, I only played four hours of the game. So maybe like after a while, it will get it seems like it could get overwhelming in a sense, like how much there is to explore. It's not an open world. I want to be clear. I'm not saying that, but 
it's still that linear firefights, but they kind of sp like branch out on these larger maps. And of course, like the hub world will also allow them to have that familiarity because you are going to so many different like uh, environments, locales, so to speak. I never left Earth in the demo now that I think of it, but it does seem like if you wanted to invest all your time into getting all these collectibles, which are which it encourages you to do because a lot of them are just like crazy upgrades that allow you to shoot three rockets at once for the cost of one. Um, but this, um, this hub world sounds surprisingly forgiving considering. I, feel, I felt like in the first one, I was always vulnerable in some way. Like sure, even if I'm progressing my skills or reloading, I still felt like right at any moment, something was probably gonna kill me. Yeah, it it was kind of, it, from what I saw, it mainly just happens at the end of missions. Okay. Um, so it's kind of like the bookend for missions or the interlude until you get into that, yeah, that very unsafe, until you get into that very unsafe area on the, whatever, whatever the next locale might be. And I didn't really get to experience the overall flow of mission, hub world, mission, hub world. I went to the hub world after I got the ice bomb or right before I got the ice bomb. And I was about to get the super shotgun before the end of my demo. But the game kind of has this like wink. It's like you're about to jump and get it. It's like that rotating green pickup. And then all of a sudden, like this door closes and you, it's it's clear it's going to be like a mission to get it, oh. um, which is kind of it feeds into what they were saying. Like, we don't want people just to rely on one gun. And again, the game, it, even if it's one thing to say they don't want people to do that, but it's one thing to make a game that actually encourages you to use the entire tool set. And for my, you know, three or four hours, it really felt like it did. And I left uh, excited to see what was going to happen in the next four hours and four after that. So overall, what would you say are the top three improvements from Dune 2016 to Dune Eternal? Okay, I would say the first one is how they managed to expand the tool set without just like piling things on top. It, it, it's They've added depth to it that kind of just like so much of what I enjoyed about this game was on a, a, a subconscious level to the point where that was one of the few demos I've done in a while sometimes those can be kind of you know it's it's pre obviously they're doing their job but it's also like us going like oh, okay well i don't want to speak too much to this the overall quality of the game that was definitely a game i've played where i left still kind of like i wasn't even just thinking about what i played i was still kind of like feeling it the muscle memory which is <laughs> kind of crazy but also very cool also very dangerous if you have to go on the subway right oh yeah, yeah no i i didn't blood punch anybody <laughs> number two i would have to say is I, I do like the fact that they're expanding the story past just flavor text. Um, I'm one of those people who thinks if a game tells a story through its systems or whatever, you don't need to have like a narr like a plot, like a script on top of it. Uh, it seems like they understand that. Of any company developer to understand that, it would probably be the one. I, I do like that they're expanding that. It didn't get in the way. Again, none of the cutscenes were long where I was like, okay, I'm. I had my like hand like on the mouse and keyboard ready to start playing the whole cutscene because I didn't really know. It's not like it's a surprise cut back to playing, but it was very much, you know, we, we know you want to keep playing, but we also have some cool context what's going on here. And three, I love just, uh, oddly enough, how hilarious that game is. It is just, even if you're not into like death metal acid trip storytelling, it's still just so confident in itself and it bleeds over and it, it just kind of like brainwashes you to be on board with anything it's doing. And I'm, if that's only from four hours, I can't speak to the overall, unless maybe something terrible happens halfway through and the game just doesn't work. I highly doubt that's the case. Um, but if it did, like even those first four hours would be a game I very much would like to return to. And I'm looking forward to it in March.